This afternoon, uh, many of you will know of Sam Walsh. Uh, he is many things. So I'm just going to go through some of the highlights uh, of his uh, distinguished career. Uh, chair of the Accenture Global Mining Council in the UK, uh, the Gold Corporation uh, in Australia, the Perth Mint, uh, the Perth Diocesan Trust and the Royal Flying Doctor Service. He's a non-executive director of Mitsui & Co, which of course is based in Japan. Uh, Sam was the Rio Tinto Chief Executive from January of 2013 to July of 2016 uh, when he retired after a 25-year career with the International Mining Group. Sam started his career in the automotive industry, working for 20 years in senior leadership roles with General Motors and with Nissan Australia. Uh, outside of work, he's played a key role in charity community as well as business associations here in Australia, uh, in Japan, and also in the United Kingdom. In recognition of his distinguished service to the mining industry and the community of WA, Sam was appointed an Officer of the Order of Australia, an AO that is, in 2010, and was awarded Western Australian Citizen of the Year in the Industry and Commerce Division in 2007. He is a Fellow of the Australian Institute of Management, the Australasian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy, the Australian Institute of Company Directors, the UK Institute of Directors, the Chartered Institute of Purchasing and Supply, the Australian Academy of Technological Services and Engineering, and was previously Treasurer of the International Council on Mining and Metals. He has a Bachelor of Commerce from Melbourne University and has completed a fellowship program at Kettering University in Michigan. He has honorary doctorates from UWA and ECU and has been awarded a Graduate of Distinction, a Lifetime Achievement Award at the University of Melbourne, made an honorary fellowship at the Melbourne Business School, uh, the Oz IMM Institute Medal, and a former visiting fellow at Oxford University. And having done a bit of research on Sam in the last week or so, I can tell you I've only really just scratched the surface. So that ticks a few off the list anyway. Would you please welcome our guest this afternoon, Sam Walsh, AO. Can everyone hear me I'm on, the, on the different microphone now? Uh, Sam, thank you so much for joining us. How are you? No, that's my pleasure to be here, Tim, and I'm great. I'm you, you were actually uh, up here on the stage at St Barbara's Day back in 2003 for the WA Minor Club. Do you remember yeah, that? I don't one? think it was exactly here. Not, but, not but, here, uh, no? Yes, I was, yeah. This was um, still a patch of land back then. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, nice oh. to have you back. Good to be here. Um, as I mentioned, you know, so many titles uh, you've held accolades that have been uh, bestowed upon you over many years, but you want to get an idea of, of, of the Sam Walsh behind all these official titles uh, that you've had. So um, let's go back to your early years. Um, I regret to say Sam is not actually a real West Australian, he's Victorian. But we I've only been that. here since 1994, so <laughs> it, it doesn't count. We'll give you a passport, that's <laughs> fine. Um, you grew up in Bayside, Melbourne, mm. one of five children. Mm. Uh, what was life like in the Walsh household growing up in Bayside, Melbourne? Well, I, we lived in uh, the, the suburb of Brighton, which is on the beach, and, and uh, life was on the beach, whether it was uh, summer or winter, sort of swimming all year round. Scouting, uh, I, I went right through scouts, and I, I think that that was really the start of my learning on, about leadership. And church was always very important. And, and again, I, I went through a range of choir and sacristan and parish council, inter-church council. I mean, it, I, whatever I did, uh, I gave it everything. And, and whatever I did, I, I tried to add value. But as I say, I, I think uh, my leadership training started with scouting. Mm. Mm. Uh as well, practicing the trumpet, playing the piano. <laughs> uh, it sounds like there was some, some routine and, some, and, and discipline in your life from an early age. Yes, <clears throat> although the interesting thing is my life was really outside school. It, it wasn't in school. And, and so I can remember uh, <clears throat> we had to join the cadets. And of course I chose the band and I played the trumpet. And we'd go on bivouac and everyone else would have sort of 303 guns and the band, well, we'd have our trumpets and drums and what have you, and we, we went out on manoeuvres and, and we sort of pointed out that, you know, we didn't have anything to play soldiers, and they said, well, you can use your finger. So, 
We just went off into the bush and disappeared. Uh, at the age of 15, life took a pretty mm. unexpected and, and tragic turn. You lost your father quite mm. suddenly. How did that impact you at the time? Yeah, it was a huge, huge impact. I mean, part of it you don't actually realise at the time. Uh, my father died when he was 55, and I remember people saying, oh, he's so young. Well, I was 15, and I thought, 55, that's not a bad innings. Uh, sitting here at 72, I think, yeah, he was pretty young. Um, but I, I guess the momentous thing that, that sort of came out of it was my elder siblings had, had sort of left home and I, I was the, uh, the fourth child and, and the eldest child at home. My mother had never written a cheque. She'd never worried about sort of paying the bills or anything like that. And suddenly all of that sort of fell on my shoulders uh, at 15. Of course you do it. But, you know, when I reflect on it, whether I, I think, you know, I've got grandchildren who are over 15, I think, would, would they be mm. capable of doing it? I'm, I'm not sure. They, they probably would, but... Uh, so, yeah, I was thrown in the deep end and, and I had no choice but, but swimming. Mm. So you grew up early. You grew up quickly. Yeah. Mm. Um, so you're on a steep learning curve from the age of 15. Mm. When you got to the end of your schooling years, what was your plan? Well, the plan was to go to university. I, I was the first member of my family to go to university and, and, and that was pretty, pretty important for me. It, it's very different these days for you young people that are here. Uh, university is far more common. But back then, about 2% of the population went to university. So it, it was quite, quite a strange thing. Mm. So I had nobody, again, to, to lean on. Uh, you, you had to sort of you know, do it yourself. Yep. Uh, so Bachelor of, of Commerce mm. uh, at the University of Melbourne. Mm. Uh, from there, you went over to the States uh, to yeah. Kettering in Michigan. How did you end up there? What, yeah, what's well, the link? No, I, I, uh, I graduated and, and it was actually quite funny because I, uh, I, I had all sorts of summer jobs. My you know, father had died, I, I had to contribute. And I, I was working as a bottolo in the northern suburbs of, of Melbourne. and I was on commission. I'd take a truck out and, and uh, sort of load the truck with 600 uh, dozen uh, beer bottles. Uh, a day. Anyway, so I decided, well, I, I need to get a real job. And so I applied for GMH. And I thought, oh, well, this will be a, a learning exercise. I'll, I'll do this and see how it goes. Well, I got the job. And uh, of course, my colleagues at GM, well, what have you been doing, Sam? And, and uh, I said, oh, well, I, I was working as a bottler. And, and uh, they, they sort of laughed. And I said, well, you, you can laugh, but I was earning more being a bottle than I was being a trainee buyer at, at GMH. Anyway, on the notice board, there was a, an advertisement for a, a scholarship to go to Michigan uh, to study and, and to work. And again, I applied, and everybody around me says, well, you'll never get it. And I said, well, it'll be good experience for me to, to try and, and do it. And lo and behold, I was successful. And a year and a half after joining GMH, I was on my way to the, the States, my, my first overseas trip. Mm. It was a fantastic experience because it taught me how a business worked. I, I worked obviously in supply, which was my discipline, but I also worked in engineering, in finance, in data processing. I, I learned how to program in COBOL. If there's anybody here who feel that they, they have a problem with their COBOL. Some young people are looking at me thinking, what, what's he talking about? <laughs> uh, this was back in 1973 and COBOL yeah. was sort of the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the language, the IT language at the time. And, and then Kettering University was all about, it, it was basically an MBA and uh, it, it was sort of giving you the techniques and what have you, a bit of psychology, a, a bit of management training and what have you that you could then use back uh, at Buick and, of course, back at Holden when I arrived, yeah. uh, back, back at Holden. So you're working for Holden uh, in mm. Australia mm. for General Motors. Uh, are you a car nut, Sam? I mean, there'd be some people hearing that just going, that sounds amazing. Um, you well, know, reminiscing about all these classic old Holdens. Are you a, are you a car person? 
I, I am and I'm not. I, car industry is very, very different to mining. You know, the new model is the be-all and end-all. And you, know, you put enormous effort into it and it gets massive promotion and what have you. It's a bit like for us when you bring on a new mine. All of the excitement, all of the challenge, all of the issues associated with bringing on a new mine. That, that was bringing on a, a, a new car. And, and yes, <clears throat> as I moved up to senior ranks at, at uh, GMH, you know, I, I had a, a couple of company cars and, you know, yes, you tried out the latest and what have you. But am I a car nut? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I, I appreciate fine vehicles just between us. Yeah. I drive a Bentley Flying <laughs> Spur. <laughs> but, uh, and I enjoy, I enjoy a good car. Not some souped up classic Monaro or anything then? No, so, no. That's mildly disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> you had a reputation uh, during your time at, at GMH as someone who restructured, mm. shut stuff down mm. as well. How does that reputation sit with you? Yeah, it was all pretty, pretty tough. Uh, when the uh, CEO of, of uh, GMH called me in to say that he wanted me to go on the team that was going to restructure Holden and they wanted the, the next senior management to be the guys who were doing this work, I thought, fantastic, this is seriously, seriously good. Then he said, oh, by the way, um, we are technically bankrupt. We have $650 million of negative shareholder funds uh, and Detroit won't put in another cent until we've got a rescue plan. And by the way, we want you to lead it. And I left his office thinking, good grief, how did I put myself in for this? Um, one of the chaps on the team says, well, this is the third time I've been on one of these teams and, and uh, you know, you just spent three months studying it and, and uh, then, then, you know, you give them a report and, and uh, you, life moves on. I said, well, not this time. Th this time we're going to mean business and, and we're going to change the company. And that's exactly what we did and, and the company survived for another 25 years after that. But yes, we, we did close five plants. I mean, when, when GMH was established, it was 100% of the marketplace and they'd never ever downsized, recognising that they were 17% of the marketplace. I don't know why they were keeping 100% of the capacity, but they were basically over capacitized and, and that was a real problem. And uh, there were 25,000 people working at GMH at that time and we downsized to 15,000. It was pretty tough. But people didn't realise, people didn't know that there was an issue, that there was a problem. People didn't realise that the Japanese were coming in and, and they were stealing market share. You know, I can re remember somebody jokingly saying, oh, the, the only engineering advance by the Japanese was the coffee cup holder that they put in their cars, which was absolute nonsense. And uh, you know, gradually the, the Japanese uh, stole the marketplace from GMH, who didn't look sideways. They were leading the marketplace. They thought everybody would follow them. Uh, they actually didn't. And the people didn't realise that, that uh, the company was actually making negative shareholder returns. Mm. It, it's a lesson for all of us because, uh, you know, at times we don't share how the business is travelling uh, with our team. We expect them to do miracles. We expect them to, uh, to deliver the volumes and deliver the cost and the revenue and what have you, but we, we don't actually provide the feedback as to how things are going. That was an important lesson from restructuring GMH. So how did the, the switch from GMH over to Nissan uh, come about then? Yeah, I'd, I'd risen to the top of my field. At, at, I would, as I mentioned, I was in supply. And uh, a whole raft of people, after I restructured GM, they basically headhunted me, and Nissan was one of them. And Nissan offered me supply and engineering, simultaneous engineering. I thought, this is fantastic. So I grabbed that. Uh, within a year, I was running all of the manufacturing. 
the plastics plant, the trim plant, the vehicle assembly, the stamping plant, the, uh, the foundry business. Uh, I was running it all. Um, and I mean, that, that was a very, very good time because uh, we, we went from the year before I joined, Nissan had had the lemon of the year, i.e. the worst car of the year, to... What was that, by the way? Just... <laughs> well, b believe it or not, that, that was the, the Skyline. Um, the old Skyline. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the shoebox on wheels. Yeah. Um, but but uh, we, we were successful in turning the quality around. Lots of focus, lots of involvement, lots of shop floor management. And we were exporting cars uh, to Japan. Very, very high standard of, of quality. Uh, but of course the button plan sort of bit, bit in and, and uh, that basically uh, marginalised Nissan and, and uh, when they started to get the wobbles, uh, I was approached by Rio Tinto, or CRA as it was then, uh, to, to join them. Mm. What did you know of the resources game when you were wrapping things up? I, I didn't know very much. I, I, I knew that they were global businesses. I knew that uh, they were competing internationally. But I remember going to my first managing directors conference and they were talking a language that I just had no idea what they were talking about. All the sort of things that they thought was uh, important. Uh, you know, I had to get somebody to translate it all. Acronyms that I'd never ever heard of. Um, but I was running uh, the manufacturing side of Rio Tinto. Um, th they had gone down a path of vertical integration and, and they had foundry businesses in Australia, the US and Chile. And I ran those businesses. In fact, my, my job was to turn the businesses around and, and sell them, uh, which, which we did. Um, except for the business in Chile where the CEO at the time thought, well, this business is now doing okay, we should hang on to it. And I said, no, 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 we should get rid of it. I'm circling the globe every five weeks. I can't keep doing this. Um, as you sort of provide the focus and leadership and support to the management there, who quite frankly when I arrived had no idea what they were doing. Well, I, I mean, I think for those of you who are on, on the edge of mining, you know miners are really, really good at mining. When it comes to manufacturing, mm, it gets a lot harder. And uh, with, with Rio Tinto, they knew nothing about the foundry businesses. so. And I brought that expertise. I read an interesting quote about you, described you as like having an iron fist in a velvet glove. <laughs> How does that line sit with you? Yeah, look, I think it's right. Um, if, if you're changing businesses, you need to be tough. You need to be focused. You need to provide the support and resources to the business to do that. And I think people realised that, that uh, you know, once we're moving down a path, that's what we're going to be doing. CEOs have a problem. C CEOs sort of, they, they run about 20 laps ahead of the rest of the organisation. And they're not ready for the rest of the organisation to catch up when they move on to the next initiative, the next sort of brainwave that, that they have. And the organisation is still trying to catch up you know, the organisation could be six months, could be a year behind them. Well, particularly Rio Tinto, 36 countries, uh, 500 subsidiaries. You know, it, it's a big, big business to, to turn around. And you've just got to provide focus. You, you can't keep jumping around from one thing to another. Or else what happens in your organisation? They say, well, this is a fad of this week. We won't do anything, we'll just wait for the next fad to come along and we'll see if we want to do that. It's seriously, seriously important for senior leaders in organisations to be consistent, to have that focus. So, yeah, iron glove, yeah, I think that's right. You'll take that? Yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> you held a number of roles at, at, at Rio prior to mm. 2004 when you were asked to head up the iron ore division. Um, what are the milestones that you're most proud of 
during that time? We're still obviously pre, pre CEO. Yeah, I, I, John Ralph was the CEO of CRA, and he he, uh, he rang me up and he, he said, "Oh, Sam, we'd we, we'd like you to move to Hammersley Iron." I said, well, thank you, John. I, I haven't quite finished what I'm doing in turning around the foundries. He says, I know you've done enough. We need you over in iron ore. So I, I moved over to iron ore and sales and marketing. And You won't believe it, but that was a time when iron ore was selling for $20 to $25 a tonne, that you had trouble selling every single ounce of iron ore. I don't know how many trips I made to China talking to customers that we had absolutely no business with but that I was very hopeful that, that we'd have business. Anyway, I was very, very successful and, and uh, <coughs> the, the CEO of, of Iron Ore called me in and said, Sam, we've got a problem. And I said, oh, well, what's the problem? And he says, well, you've oversold our capacity. What are we going to do? And I said, well, there's a very easy answer. Move me to operations and I'll fix it. <laughs> and, and that's exactly what he did. I mean, every organisation has got latent capacity. Now, I know you're all sitting there saying, what the hell is he talking about? We're running flat out. You couldn't get another tonne out of our operation. There will be latent capacity there. There will be things that, uh, that don't run smoothly, that, that uh, you can work through with focus. I, I bought Lean Six Sigma into the mining industry and I remember at the time people saying, that, that's a manufacturing technology. You know, that'll never work here. And I said, oh, so when a haul truck moves from the shovel to the ROM, it always has the same amount of material in it and it takes the same time to get there. Oh, no, no, we don't do that. Ah, so there is variation in mining and there is an opportunity to apply the discipline of, of uh, Six Sigma to mining. And, and that's, that's exactly uh, what, what I did to help us actually meet this darn excess sales that, that we had. But, I mean, it, it, was, a, it was a great adventure as I brought technology to, to mining. You know, sitting here today, you know, you, you all know about automated haul trucks, automated drills, automated trains, remote operation centre. I mean, it, it's just par for the course as to how you operate. No, no. Back when I moved into operations, we did none of that. We, we just simply had, had, well, I can remember reading a little book that they gave me about Tom Price. And uh, it talked about technology and introducing conveyors into mining uh, in the early 1900s. The only problem was that the Swedes had introduced it into manufacturing in the late 1890s. <laughs> so, you know, we, we were dragging our feet even with the introduction of conveyors. So th that, that was an important time for the company. The other thing that, that uh, we did was expand the iron ore operations. And, uh, over that time, we committed $20 billion, not million, $20 billion in expanding the Pilbara. And recently, I made a, a, a trip up, and people were very proudly showing me uh, the expanded port and other operations. And, you know, I was part of that journey, and, and it was great to actually see it operating, and people so proud that uh, it, it's all working. Uh, fast forward a few years mm. now. When you got tapped on the shoulder uh, to lead the, the entire company as the CEO, can you talk us through that moment? Where were you? How was the contact made? Yeah, it was actually very, very funny because uh, Leanne, my wife and I, we, we were in Singapore for a long weekend, staying at the Raffles, where else would you stay? And, and uh, I, I woke up on the Saturday morning and lo and behold, there was a message from the CEO, know that you're on holidays, an emergency board meeting is called, drop everything, come as you are. Well, I said to Leanne, I've never been to a Rio Tinto board meeting where you wear fancy dress. <laughs> I, I had an Hawaiian shirt and, you know, it, it just wasn't going to work. 
So we spent our holiday sort of weekend shopping around in Singapore, trying to get me a suit and trying to get me a nice white shirt and tie, um, which is not easy when you're handsomely proportioned like I am and you're in Singapore. Anyway, we, we found a, a 24 hour uh, tailor and I thought everything was going to be fine and, until uh, there were actually two tailors, one to do the trousers and one to do the jacket. And it was a pinstripe suit and I could see that it wasn't exactly going to... <laughs> anyway, Leanne, Leanne, God bless her, Leanne says, well, you've got to negotiate. You know, th you're in Singapore, you've got to negotiate. I said, I am not negotiating. If I take 25% out of the price, then there'll be 25% taken out of the suit. And I can't, can't be there at the board meeting with my sleeve coming off. Well, by the Thursday, we had the emergency board meeting, and by Thursday of that week, I, I was actually appointed uh, CEO of Rio Tinto, and I had the biggest barrage of cameras that you have ever seen with me in my 24-hour suit, <laughs> which had held together. But, but it was a, a, a very interesting experience. Um, if I could sort of put it in a nutshell, Rio was living beyond, beyond its means. Uh, my predecessor had, had, had a growth focus and he'd relaxed the controls that we had in place that really made the strength of the company and its investment decisions. And uh, so my very first day, I, I was there at the investment committee, which I wasn't a member of previously, and I realised what had happened, that project champions were putting up their projects but there was nobody assessing them. There was nobody saying, well, you know, that's a pretty heroic, or are you serious that you're going to do that? And we, we did some research on project, projects, and we found good projects are always good projects. Marginal projects are always marginal. People do get heroic. They think, well, <clears throat> to make this project get over the line, we'll achieve a 20% reduction in cost and we'll reduce the capital by 10%. And of course, it never happens. And so these marginal projects turn into dogs. Uh, Rio at that time had a belief that if a project had a positive NPV, then it was a good project. Well, that didn't deal with these marginal type projects. We, we didn't have a hurdle for projects to, to get through apart from the fact that they had to have a positive NPV. So Chris Lynch, the, the CFO, and I introduced a, a, a hurdle for projects, IRR of 15% or greater, or we weren't going to invest in it. It cleared the air. It, it actually meant that we dropped a whole lot of projects that weren't going to be value-adding. And we focused on, on the good projects. At, at that time that I took over, Rio had 22 billion of debt. They were spending 17 billion dollars a year on, on new capital. And as I say, we, we just couldn't afford it. We we're living beyond our means. Our costs had, had escalated. Working capital, working capital is huge in the car industry. Mining companies don't seem to focus on working capital. But Rio Tinto had $5 billion of, of working capital. And people didn't realise that you were having to pay interest on the borrowings of that $5 billion. It was also overhanging the market. You know, because our customers knew that you, know, you had these mountains of uh, iron ore and other products that, that uh, were, were waiting at your ports. So we pulled $3 billion out of our working capital. And we never missed a shipment. Cost, I mentioned our costs had escalated. We pulled 6.8 billion out of our cost. Billion, not million. And we changed the way that we were running the business. Uh, we, we were forecasting quarterly and, and uh, I said, in a changing world, you can't forecast quarterly, you've got to forecast monthly. Oh, we can't do that. 500 subsidiaries, you can never do that. And, and I said, well, of course we can. Yeah, almost all your costs are fixed. Sam, Sam, you don't understand. 
No, there are variable costs and there are fixed costs. And I said, oh, great. So we're going to hire a lot more people next month, are we? No. Are we going to pay them more? No. Oh, so you're telling me that labour is fixed in the short term? Well, yes. And we went through all the variables. Once you know that what your volume is, you, you can actually forecast. And that's what we did. And, and after a couple of months, the finance folk came back to me and said, well, our forecasts are within 5% accuracy. And I said, that's all we need. Because you can do something about next month. You can't do anything about last month. It's actually gone. And with apologies to the accountants in the room, I mean, yes, you need your accounts, and yes, it's interesting to look at trends, but you can't influence what happened last month. It's spilt milk. You, you, can't, you can't do anything about it. But by gosh, you can do something about next month, and that's what we did. I, I had a, a few trite sort of giveaways for staff. You know, I wanted them to act as owners of the business not managers or not employees. And you can say, well, hang on, what, what's that mean? What's the difference there? Owners of a business think differently to people that are just operating. And I said that, uh, you know, I want you to spend money as if it was your own. I can remember travelling to one of our remote operations and, and the superintendent there said, Sam, I had a project for $10,000. If it was my money, I wouldn't have spent it, and I haven't. Which, which was a huge sort of impact across the business, both in terms of reducing our capital expenditure and in improving our cost structure. And all of that was important, uh, very important at that time for Rio, who, as I say, you know, we're, we're just living beyond their means. Starting to get a real sense of that uh, iron <laughs> fist in the velvet glove now, oh, Sam. there you go. Um, I have to ask, uh, Duke and Gorge, obviously it was a, a, a place that you were familiar with from your time as, as a CEO. Mm. Um, can you tell us what your reaction was when you heard about uh, the terrible damage there? I, I was incredibly disappointed and incredibly frustrated um, that, that it had happened. Um, I mean, Rio has done such incredibly good work um, with Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islanders. You know, we, we had the largest number of Aboriginals working in our business of any company in Australia. We, we had the first major Indigenous land use agreement, the Yandy Agreement, that the Prime Minister was involved in the signing. We had 15 Indigenous land use agreements. We had all sorts of businesses sort of servicing uh, the operations. And you, you just wondered what on earth happened that allowed Duke and Gorge to, to happen. I don't know if you know, o over the last 10 years, there's been 967 requests for Section 8 uh, rulings. S sorry, Section 18. Section 18 is when you, you're going to impinge on Aboriginal land. Only three of those were rejected. And I'm just so pleased that mining companies are now going back to the Aboriginal corporations and saying, look, we know we've got a Section 18, but could, could we rediscuss these? Because we understand the sensitivity. Uh, outside of mining, Sam, we know you're an incredibly passionate supporter of uh, the arts. Mm. You have next to no interest in sport. In fact, your lack of golfing ability is quite famous. <laughs> <laughs> um, and bizarrely as well, you're also an avid collector of antique milk jugs. Hmm. How on earth did that start? Well, it, I don't, for all of you that, that travel, you know that you get to a weekend and you, you, at some place, some city, some whatever, and what do you do with yourself? Well, I love antiques. But when I'm travelling, you can't bring home a dining room table or you know, a cupboard or whatever, but a milk jug you actually could. So I started, I think probably 40 years ago, I started collecting milk jugs. Don't tell my wife, but I've got 380 milk jugs sort of <laughs> stashed away. The oldest, well, a number of the, the older jugs, 400 BC. Sitting here, BC. 
sit, 400 BC, yeah, wow. sitting here in Perth. I, I've got a lot around 1750, which is when the technology transferred from China to Europe for fine bone China. I had a friend a while ago say, Sam, Sam, you're wrong. No, the technology did not come from China. The technology came from the Middle East. I said, oh, oh, that's very, very interesting. I always wondered why we called porcelain China. Now I know. <laughs> Too the, the technology did come from China. And, and uh, the, the milk jugs around 1750 all looked like they were made in China because you know, they imported uh, Chinese milk jugs and, and what have you into Europe. And when they started introducing the fine bone china made in England or made in France or made in Germany, guess what? They looked like they were made in China. Yeah, there you go. I bet you didn't think we'd be talking about antique milk jugs here this <laughs> afternoon, did you? <laughs> I'm sorry, Leanne, it sounds like he's still got uh, some enthusiasm for it. So <laughs> the collection is probably growing still, right? <laughs> Um, I mentioned earlier, Sam, your many, many titles and accolades mm. that you've had over the years. Uh, more recently, uh, you have had strong links with Japan throughout much of your mm. career, and you were given this terrific honour uh, by Japan just recently, the Order of the Rising Sun. If you don't know about it originally, it sounds, sounds like it could be a Karate Kid sequel, but it's not. It's a very mm. serious honour. Yeah, the, um, the honour was established in uh, 1875 by the Emperor Meiji. It, it is uh, an award made by the Emperor of Japan. And uh, it, it, it is a big, I mean, it's like the Order of Australia or a knighthood in the UK. It, it really is uh, a, a huge honour for somebody who's worked uh, in Japan almost 40 years. Um, I've described how I worked for Nissan for five years. I've been on the Mitsui board in Japan. Uh, this is my sixth year. So I've had a very strong connection with Japan. I importantly, as with an Order of Australia, they do a lot of checking on you. And I'm just pleased to say over those 40 years, I, I didn't stub my toe or didn't insult somebody so much that they say, Sam Walsh is not going to get this honour. Mm. And, and the honour really is... And here's one we prepared earlier. <laughs> the honour really is something. So it's... This, this is the honour. It, it's... Uh, it, it has six levels. This is the third level. To get the first level, you have to be a Prime Minister or President of a country. I missed out on that. To, to get the second level, you have to be a Secretary of State or an Ambassador uh, to Japan. I missed out on that. But this is the highest civilian uh, order, and I mean, it was a huge surprise for me to get it, but uh, boy, uh, what, what, what a thing. So I, I get a little lapel badge, and I'm kind of hoping that as I go through immigration and customs, I, I may get treated with a little bit of respect. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see for that. Yeah. Because most, most people in Japan haven't ever, ever met anybody who's, who's received it. I guess in a way it's like the Order of Australia, there, there aren't that many of those. And uh, I, I had some friends in Japan who actually came down for the ceremony because they said, we know of the honour, but we've never met anybody who actually received it. So I was very honoured to have them mm. come down. Mm. Uh, Sam, we have got a bunch of questions from the audience uh, and I'm afraid to say we are out of time. So I'm just going to finish on perhaps this one mm. uh, philosophical question that's mm. come through. Please don't give too philosophical an answer. No, 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 I've got half a second. Because <laughs> the time's getting away from us. But uh, the question goes, if you could say one sentence, just one to change this person's life, what would it be? I, I would say, have more trust in your own judgment. You know, I, I think all of us sort of, uh, I, I guess, nervous to trust our own judgment, trust our own experience, trust our own knowledge. And, and we tend to, to sort of hang bat. You know, I, I used to talk about the fact that uh, you know, everybody has a, a, a span of control from here to here. And a lot of people work down the bottom of it because it's nice and safe and secure and you, know, you won't step out of line. And you think your boss is not noticing that you're operating down there in, instead of up here. 
I, my advice would be to operate up here, to have trust and faith in your own judgment and to make a difference and to add value. That, that, that's, what, that's what life's about. That's what business is about. Let's leave it there, an inspiring way to finish things up. Thank you so much, uh, Sam Walsh. <laughs> Thank you for being our guest once again uh, for this uh, very special St Barbara's Day lunch. I'm going to hand you over now to Nat. He walked from her time, and when she wakes up and makes up her mind, you say I'm not so tough just because I'm in love with an uptown girl. You know I can't afford to buy her purse, but maybe someday when my ship comes in, understand the kind of guy I've been, and then I win. Ooh, oh, oh, oh. I bet you never had a back dog guy. I bet her mama never told her why. Gonna try. And when she's walking, she's looking so fine that she's mine. She'll say I'm not so tough just because I smoke drugs with an uptown girl. She's been living in a rough town world Bet she never had a back dog guy Bet her mama never told her why Gonna try for an uptown girl My uptown girl My uptown girl No, I'm in love with an uptown girl My uptown 